Another nuclear icebreaker of Project 22220 has been laid down in Russia proudly named Stalingrad. It will join the already most powerful icebreaker fleet in the world, which no other country can match today. Meanwhile, the Americans, having despaired in their attempts to build even a single icebreaker of their own, have turned to Finland for help. What might they achieve and why did Trump suddenly need to catch up with Russia? We'll talk about this as well as about the new hero of the week after a brief summary of positive news. Another batch of heavy flamethrower systems, Toes 1A Salt Sepiok with upgraded protection against UAVs, has been delivered to the troops. A new production facility has been launched at the Irkutsk Aviation Plant, and Koldingstan has started manufacturing five axis grinding complexes for the aviation industry. The Russian company Cognitivny Pilot has developed the first domestic robot with artificial intelligence for express analysis of agricultural land. Rostec has started mass production of smart surveillance systems for strike drones. Production of low-floor buses has been launched in Ulyanovsk. A new model of construction dump truck is being produced in Kaliningrad. Tomograph production has started in Moscow. And electrical engineering products are being manufactured in Yuzhnoralsk. On December 5, 1957, the world's first nuclear-powered icebreaker was launched in Leningrad. It was named Lenin and became the world's first surface vessel with a nuclear power plant. Even in those years, the country faced the task of developing the Northern Sea Route, which was impossible to navigate without powerful icebreaker support. On August 17, 1977, the nuclear icebreaker Arctica became the first surface ship in history to reach the North Pole. Since then, our superiority has been undeniable and continues today, as no one else in the world has nuclear icebreakers. However, Russian engineers did not rest on Soviet laurels for long. On October 21, 2020, the fleet was joined by a brand new nuclear-powered ship, Arctica, of Project 22220, which became the lead ship in the series. This beauty is 173 meters long. Thanks to its two reactor installation of transport power, 200 reactor units, it can break through ice up to three meters thick. It was the first and this was just the beginning. Currently alongside the project's main icebreaker, three more giants, Sibir, Ural, and Yakutia are in service. Two, Chukotka and Leningrad are under construction and Stalingrad has just been laid down. In addition, the construction of the lead icebreaker, Rosia, continues at the Zvezda shipyard and we have 42 icebreakers in service, including non-nuclear ones. And by this number, we are also in first place among all other countries combined. 41 icebreakers are in operation. This bothers NATO countries, especially the United States. There are people who are still convinced that Americans have leadership in all technological fields. And if they fall behind somewhere, they can easily catch up in a short time. Of course, that's a myth. Back in 1984, a report was published in the United States about the urgent need to start developing and building new icebreakers, even if they weren't nuclear powered. More than 40 years have passed since then, and here's the result. Today, the United States Coast Guard has only one diesel-electric icebreaker left, the Polar Star, built in 1976. And recently, they purchased a used auxiliary vessel, the Storis, from a private owner. It's worth talking about it in more detail because it's very instructive. Originally, the Storis was called IVIC and was a support vessel for offshore oil production, but it was designed unusually poorly. Even with a slight sea swell, water would wash over the stern and get into the fuel system, which would disable the engines. Once the vessel was towing an oil platform and got caught in a storm, the tow line snapped, the platform drifted away and was smashed against the rocks, and the AVIC itself 
lost power due to engine failure. After that, the oil workers refused its services and the owner started looking for a new buyer and eventually found one in the United States Coast Guard. To their credit, they refused to buy this useless, good-for-nothing tub until the very last moment. But the former owning company managed to lobby the sale through the House of Representatives and force the Coast Guard to buy the ill-fated Ivic. The ship has been repainted and renamed to erase its old disgrace, but they don't know what to do next. It's not suited for real work. However, it's not to say that Americans aren't trying to solve the problem. Here's another instructive story for you. his first presidential term, Donald Trump loudly announced that the gap would be overcome and launched a program to build three new large non-nuclear icebreakers, the Polar Security Cutter. Compared to our nuclear giants, they are one and a half times smaller in size and displacement, but that's only in theory. In practice, after six years, not a single one of them has even begun construction, but the cost of the project has increased several times. Even using the German project Polar Stern 2 as a basis, it couldn't be adapted into something suitable. The process was delayed due to errors in modeling, and then it turned out that in the United States they had forgotten how to work with special strong steel alloys. According to the most optimistic forecasts, the lead icebreaker will be ready by decades end. A few people believe that. During his second term, Trump publicly stated that this time the gap with Russia would definitely be overcome and ordered the construction of 48 icebreakers at once, but later admitted that it would not be possible to do this on their own. That's why he signed a memorandum with Finland for Finland to build four icebreakers for the United States and train Americans to build them at United States shipyards. It should be noted that in this case, we're also talking about non-nuclear icebreakers. Therefore, it's still not entirely clear how Trump plans to catch up with Russia, since Russia isn't stopping at what it's already achieved either. We're building military icebreakers as well as civilian ones. One such vessel, the ICE-class patrol ship Ivan Pulpinen, Project 2355-0, was recently commissioned into the fleet and conducted its first training artillery exercises in Arctic conditions. Now the main question is, why do we and the Americans need so many icebreakers? By Russia, it's clear. We have the largest Arctic territory, and icebreakers are necessary to escort convoys of ships through the ice of the Northern Sea Route. This allows us to supply our Arctic cities as well as earn money by transporting cargo from Asia to Europe. Every year, the cargo turnover of the Northern Sea Route increases, even despite the sanctions. But why do Americans need icebreakers? Of course, they want to be able to move troops with us together with the NATO bloc. Opportunities, what opportunities? What opportunities, what opportunities, what, what opportunities, what, 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 what? I wanted to get inside the counterpart's limbs. In stores and predicting Rudum. I'll write the unavailable El Dominico. Should we talk about manipulating prices and sanctions freely? And the price of gasoline at gas stations in the United States traditionally remains one of the important factors in domestic political struggle. That's why production needs to be, if not increased, then at least not allowed to collapse. That's where icebreakers come in handy. To start developing offshore fields, the process is already underway. Trump's team has proposed for the first time in several decades to issue a number of licenses for the development of offshore oil fields in different parts of the country, including along the entire coast of Alaska. Previously, the Biden administration imposed a ban on such drilling for environmental protection reasons. But now the political direction has changed, and frankly, there is nowhere else to turn. This is why President Joe Biden is urgently trying to acquire an icebreaker fleet by any means necessary. We can only sympathize. This is neither a quick nor an easy task. But actually, why should we sympathize with him in the first place?
During the memorable meeting in Alaska, Russia apparently offered to use its icebreakers in joint projects both on our territory and on United States territory. But apparently some factors are still blocking such cooperation. Well, we will continue our work since we know how to do it quickly and professionally. The rest is not that important to us. We will keep you updated on events in the next episodes.